Welcome back to A Case for Cannabis. My name is Alfredo Matthew, founder of Working World LLC, and I am so excited to be in this beautiful apartment by Lake Merritt, Oakland, with Claudio Miranda, the CEO of Guild Enterprise. Welcome, Claudio. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I can't get over this view. Uh, is beautiful. How long have you been in Oakland? Ooh, well, I moved here to Lake Merritt in the end of 1998. I've been living in this apartment. So I came in what's relatively early for a lot of people to be coming into uh, to Oakland. Yeah, that's right. And, and, and so you pay $15 a month to live <laughs> right here on the exactly. lake. So beautiful. And you are a serial entrepreneur, right? I love meeting entrepreneurs. I love talking about entrepreneurship. Where did you get this entrepreneurial bug? Well, um, I would have to say I got it early on when I was a teenager. Um, I was born and raised in Hollywood, the L.A. area. Um, my family then moved to Orange County, but I was a bit of a street kid. Mm -hmm. um, and I uh, just kind of learned growing up in, in that part of the world that, that, that we learned to uh, kind of fend for ourselves. And we raced BMX bikes and, uh, and lived in arcades. And, and just early on, I learned uh, how to kind of make a buck, so to speak. Yeah. What I love, right, is cannabis is a street culture, yes. right? It is very much informal economy for decades and decades, That's and, right. and, it, and, it's, and it's part of the fabric of California. And so you got this bug for entrepreneurship, this bug for cannabis at an early age, yep. but you've had a pretty expansive career, right? You came up to the Bay Area, go to UC Berkeley, and then you got involved and you created other companies and businesses. What, what did you kind of get your start? Yeah, yeah well, just to kind of uh, outline the, the years there. So when I first got into cannabis was in the mid-80s, call it 1985, and was involved in various capacities uh, uh, with, with the cannabis industry at that time. Um, I moved up to the Bay Area in 1994 to go to Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And I went to Berkeley just for a couple of years, um, and I, um, I was cultivating while I was living mm -hmm. in Berkeley. So, so that's when I m kind of moved into that segment of my relationship with the plant, really learning how to um, hone in my cultivation skills. And I did that through that segment of going to school. By the time I graduated in 96, um, I had a brief stint in, uh, in banking. And, okay. and living here in the Bay Area, that was the birth of the internet, dot com yeah. one. And yeah. so I, I saw a lot of my friends getting into the internet uh, economy. And I felt like I was on the sidelines of that, just kind of watching my, my friends become millionaires on paper. Yeah. Um, and so I and decided. Then, and then lose. And, and then lose. <laughs> yeah. And so I jumped into uh, the dot com one um, around the time I moved into this apartment, uh, right at the end of 98, beginning of 99. Yeah. Um, and I got into the interactive advertising side of it and kind of learned my learned the ropes of Internet from the sales and marketing side. And then it wasn't until 2003 that I started my first internet company, which was an e-commerce company. Um, and, and I was selling uh, natural products, organic products uh, mm -hmm. via the web, uh, direct to consumer. And that's what I'd been doing at uh, the interactive ad agency. I'd focused on e-commerce, helping large retailers, Fortune 1000 retailers, Petco, Office Max, et cetera, yeah. uh, sell their product uh, SKUs online. And so really learning the chops of e-commerce and how to hone that skill and interactive advertising, uh, decided to start my own e-commerce business. And from 2003 to about 2009, I uh, did that with a business partner of mine, uh, started a couple companies. And that was, I think, when I got into more formal lines of business, um, yeah. you know, versus some of the scrappier entrepreneurial stuff I did as a kid. Yet you came back and you said... I want to get back into the cannabis industry about 2014. That was before this whole, right, recreational cannabis, everything opened up. What made you make the transition back? Yeah, well, so, um, so again, being, being part of the cannabis culture early on since the 80s, I, I had a lot of friends that moved on to do cannabis as a career. A lot of those people ended up moving up to Humboldt and the Emerald Triangle, Mendocino, and become you know large scale growers. And so I've always been observing the cannabis industry uh, throughout that period when I was not in the industry. And I always thought to myself, "Wow, what an incredible plant!" I've always had a deep respect for it, and have always longed to kind of go back in the industry. But thought I'm going to wait until it it becomes more um, formalized, yeah. when it becomes more legal. 
Um, and it was around 2013, 14, when I really started to feel comfortable enough to get back in the industry where I felt that I can do it at, at little to no risk. Um, and that was during the days of Prop 215. Mm -hmm. um, if you're familiar with that kind of era of uh, cannabis, and it had been well into Prop 215 at that time. It started a decade prior. But that's when at least I felt very comfortable with it. And I started consulting with some brands then, primarily on the retail side. Um, and that was my re-entry point into cannabis. And again, for me, it was a matter of just feeling comfortable and that, look, I'd, I felt like I, was, I didn't go to college and, and, and get into career and entrepreneurship and in, into tech just to get into, in, into an industry where I can find myself incarcerated right? yeah, and, and, and take that risk. Yeah. And so when I felt that that was de-risked enough is, is when I came back in. So we're going through a period, right, from the war on drugs to this kind of murky, ambiguous gray area where potentially in the next few years it's going to get federally legalized. And, yep. and then it's like, man, this is like, yeah. this is like every other industry and this is really growing. What have you learned as a business owner? And first tell me like, what is Guild Enterprise? Because it's more than just one thing. What, sure. what, what are your businesses about? Sure. Well, we started Guild Enterprises primarily. I mean, I'm a brand marketer by trade. I mentioned I started in kind of sales and marketing and interactive advertising. And I think over the course of my career leading up to my re-entry into cannabis, I was really focused on consumer branding, consumer retail. Um, and so Guild was primarily developed as a brand management company mm -hmm. that we developed a family of brands under the Guild moniker. And so the Guild Extracts, Guild Cannabis, Guild Nursery, the Guild, and the ideas where we would build this brand family and then license the brand out to operators at each segment of the supply chain. So nice. if you had a farm, we can license out the Guild Cannabis brand so you could brand your flower um, under that brand. Um, so that was part of the vision. That's not the whole vision, but, but that's what we started to do. And we started early on, figure out how to start trademarking. There's, there, there's, some, there's mm -hmm. some obstacles there in trademarking on the federal level. Eventually, we were, we were able to trademark um, on the state level. Um, so we have Guild under its various kind of brand uh, permutations that I mentioned. Um, under state, California state uh, trademarks, mm -hmm. um, and then federal ones under services and other goods like clothing. So anyway, we started as kind of an IP management and brand management company that then would start to incubate um, cannabis plant touching operating companies that then we would license the brand to. So there was a time in Guild history where we had numerous operating companies across the supply chain that we were licensing the brand to. But what we found a few years into that is that that got very complicated because cannabis was already very complex at the time. Yeah. Just navigating all the regulatory changes. And there was a point in the development of, of, um, of the regulation where they started to look toward breaking apart vertical integration. Mm. And so we were advised by our lawyers to break apart the idea of a brand family like that, that would touch each segment of the, of the value chain. Mm -hmm. um, so we decided to break that off and spin off those segments and just focus on some core competencies, which eventually led to just really a primary focus for Guild as Guild Extracts. Great. I love the importance of focusing on your core competency, yep. right? Not being everything <clears throat> to everyone. And this idea that complexity is the enemy of execution. You can't do manufacturing. Yep. You can't do cultivation. I mean, right? Unless you're, uh, uh, who is that? John D. Rockefeller. That's right. right. That's right. <laughs> right. I mean, I mean. So, so you have a core competency, and what are extracts? Yep. Right. Like, like, like for for the layman, for folks yeah. who don't understand, what yep. is an extract? Yeah. So extracts also known in the industry as concentrates. I mean, you're taking a, with cannabis as we know. We have the cannabis flower, and a lot of people then dry the flower and smoke it as flower. Um, but what you can do is extract from the flower the what's essentially the essential oil using layman's mm -hmm. terms, right? Just like you would um, extract from olives, you get olive oil, or from lavender, you get lavender oil, right? Mm -hmm. And so with cannabis extracts, you're essentially getting the essential oil of the cannabis flower. Um, and really what what is contained in that are all the cannabinoids, the terpenes, the flavonoids, or at least as many as you can extract that the plant affords you. And those compounds, what we call the compounds of interest, are the ones that ultimately the cannabis connoisseur is or the cannabis user is most interested in because it's within the cannabinoids 
and the terpenes and the flavonoids where you get a lot of the medical and psychoactive benefits and effects that cannabis users seek. And yeah. the extraction process lets you get to that essential oil with those compounds uh, much more efficiently than if you smoke the whole plant, yeah. which you're consuming things that don't contain things that are of interest necessarily. Yeah. So we were talking like this, the development of this industry and the development of this segment of the industry is going along with, you started with natural products and organic products. That's right. We have a whole better understanding of food and better understanding of what we're putting in our bodies and so extracts allow us to really focus on specific outcomes that we want. And correct me if I'm wrong, can, uh, cannabinoid, THC is a cannabinoid, CBD is a cannabinoid. Correct. But we don't, there's 113 of them. We don't even really understand what this plant can correct. do. Correct. And there's called what you have your major cannabinoids and your minor cannabinoids. So THC, CBD are considered the major cannabinoids. Then yeah. you have a bunch of minor cannabinoids, CBG, CBN, THCV, et cetera, et cetera. And you're exactly right. We're just starting to discover and unlock the particular benefits of each of those cannabinoids and not as they exist individually in each cannabinoid, but how they work in concert. Yeah. Right, that this cannabinoid with that cannabinoid coupled with this terpene and that terpene and that and, and that ensemble effect as we call it or the entourage effect is what creates different outcomes depending on your medical use cases or your recreational use cases. And so a lot of companies don't have the domain expertise in the science of cannabinoid science. Do they partner with Guild Extract to say, hey, we want to build, um, we want to mm. create a product, we want to create a user experience that has this. Guild Extract, help us figure out how to create a, an edible or a topical yes. that can do this. Historically, that's exactly correct. Um, I think as we move along in history, we're finding that a lot of companies are now developing that expertise. So when we first started, we were definitely pioneers in the industry uh, um, um, among a group of other, of, of course, extractors. Um, but we were some of the early folks in the industry that, that were really getting down this science, uh, down to a science, right? We were really mm -hmm. figuring out how to, how to unlock the medicinal and recreational benefits of cannabis in a way that, that advanced the, the movement in the way that we're discussing. Um, and now, though, as it matures very rapidly, we're seeing a lot of folks come in, you know, backed by venture capital. Yeah. And, um, and, and really be able to accelerate, um, I think, the scientific forefront of it, um, the therapeutic forefronts, the medicinal, pharmaceutical. And so, so now there's a lot of guild extracts to choose from in some ways, but we still have very unique IP that we were able to lock in early on, on in terms of like federal patents. Um, so absolutely. That's yeah. great. Yeah. And that is so essential. And that's a benefit that you get from being early into the industry. Yes. The, the big venture backed big corporations, they're going to come in once this is fully legal. No one can get incarcerated, all this. But if pioneers such as yourself and other entrepreneurs can get a foothold and a foundation, you're going to be able to benefit on the other side. Definitely. I mean, there's certainly first mover advantage, but I think pioneers is a good analogy because you think about the pioneers that discovered the West and moved across, you know, yeah. the, the, uh, you know, across America, there was certainly a lot of challenges with that. And, and the pioneers, you know, definitely took a lot of the hits and suffered a lot of the consequences of moving into uncharted territory, at least uncharted for the pioneers. Yeah. They were moving into other people's lands and that came with its own conflicts. But, um, Absolutely. Some of the, the few pioneers that managed to survive and lay their claims and, and, and develop their, their castles with their moats, so to speak, were the ones that ended up being advantaged. Yeah. You see, I, like I want, right, we want to share benefit. We want yeah. the legacy folks who have been here who are the true pioneers to get some of the upside yep. as this industry matures. And we need, right, ultimately, larger corporations, finances, right, everything that every other industry has is going to come to this industry. But there should, right, it's kind of like a fight for the soul of, of cannabis. It is. As, a, as someone who, right, is a legacy person making this transition to the formal economy, what have you seen from 2014 through today how many of your, your friends yeah. have you seen come and go? And, yeah. and like, what, like, what has that journey been like? Yeah, um, I mean, it's been a, a, a white-knuckle ride, so to speak, right? Um, 
most of our bio, our peers um, unfortunately haven't made it right we've seen a lot of the legacy operators um, not not survive the transition from prop 215 to prop 64 which is the state regulatory framework um, there's been a lot of challenges with it um, it's a very nascent market and like i think like a lot of early markets there's a lot of um, um, growing pains um, and using the pioneer analogy, there's just been a lot of challenges along the way. And so we're seeing uh, nowadays when I go, you know, I've, I've been to a couple conferences so far in the last, in this year, um, and in the last few months, and the face of the industry has changed completely. Um, you're seeing about um, 90 plus percent new brands, new companies, new entrepreneurs. That is the second wave. And again, you can think about .com one, that if mm -hmm. you came into the internet in the late 90s and then came in the internet again into the industry in 2003, 2004, you would see a very different crop of companies and entrepreneurs. You know, remember in .com one, yeah. we had, in the search engines, for, we had Alta a and Lyco and AOL and AOL, Netscape yeah. and, and all these guys, yeah. right? And, and at the end of that, you saw very few of them kind of make it through to the second round. Yeah. Um, and I would say it's it's the few that survived. And that's certainly the case. What we're seeing in cannabis. Well, is what we see in business. What and, we see and, in business. And, and right. I like right. We're the same age. We're like coming. I didn't realize how difficult it was to make it in business and that the longevity of most companies it's not long, right? Like that's of right. every uh, only four percent of entrepreneurs survive 10 years. That's correct. Four percent, ninety six percent don't make right. Fifty percent. That's right. Don't make it past two years. Yes. Right. So it's like, this is very. It's a very challenging thing, but there's an incredible upside. There's an incredible reward, and it's not just the financial side. What is it that keeps you going? That 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 makes you know, right? Why, why do you love this? Why do sure. you take on that white knuckle ride? Sure. Well, I mean, it's interesting because you say there's an incredible reward, but one would argue that well. I would certainly agree with that, 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 that the fruits of your labor, the kind of the end goal there, that if you have that, that exit, that, that coveted exit yeah. that everyone's striving for. But I'm a believer that, you know, um, that every step along the way, the journey is probably the most important part of it because it's through the journey that you experience. It's through the ups and the downs and mm -hmm. through the challenges. I mean, one can argue that that's where you develop character. That's where you learn. I mean, a lot of entrepreneurs uh, would argue that it's been through their darkest moments, through their lows, that they uh, get the greatest learnings, right? It's, it's exactly in their failures where they learn the most and they advance the most. And again, that's where you develop you know, real character. And that's when you face your demons is when you gain your greatest truths. Um, and so it's along the journey that all that happens. And it's an end in itself. You're, you're essentially reaping rewards at every step of the way, provided that you view it that way and you can stomach the process. Yeah. I mean, failure is fine as long as you get back up. Well, exactly. Right. 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 Resilience is incredibly important. Um, what do you <clears throat> say to people who are just coming into the industry now, right? To mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who up until this point, any, right, there's a stigma around the industry. Many people didn't want to make the shift, right? I, I know entrepreneurs and folks who are, they don't want to put it on their LinkedIn profile, right? right? Or I've been, I've, I'm not in cannabis. I'm in entrepreneurship workforce. I created this podcast series with the community colleges. I'm pushing it out on LinkedIn. A lot of people will not like it, right? Because they don't want to, be yep. seen as this. What would you say to people who are still on the fence about the industry? Yeah, well, phew, that's there's so many ways to answer that question. Um, well, first and foremost, you know, understand this is a nascent industry. It's a nascent market. And all the challenges that we've been talking about come with it. And so with entrepreneurship, especially if it's an entrepreneur that's coming in, a lot of it's about timing. You know, um, and I would argue that a lot of the entrepreneurs that have come in thus far have realized that they were busy working hard to pave the roads, right? That you yeah. were going against, you know, just raw terrain. Yeah. We're paving the roads and now the people coming after us are able to drive right down those roads, mm. right? So part of it is just really understanding the timing of where and when to enter the market. And it's very segment specific, you know, with cannabis, 
there's all the plant touching side of it, which is, you know, cultivators, extractors, retailers, distributors. But then there's all the ancillary companies, you know, technology companies, people who provide all the other services, insurance, banking, legal, right? And so depending on which segment of the industry you're entering in, where you're essentially dropping in within the ecosystem, there's going to be a different answer in terms of the timing of when you should drop in and how you should drop in. Mm. And so in talking with entrepreneurs that might be trying to get in the industry, I would first say, well, well, what are you looking to get out of it, right? And what end of the industry are you trying to come in on? And depending on their answer, if they want to come in as a cultivator versus an insurance provider versus someone in banking or technology, there is going to be a different answer because we've seen that some people within the ecosystem have benefited much more greatly based on their timing and how they navigate the maze versus others, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I definitely see that. I don't, I'm not sure if everyone knows how to enter the yeah. industry. Yeah. I think, you know, um, from the outside, I'm like, oh, you have to grow cannabis in order to be in the industry or, right, you have to touch the plant. But you're saying that there are so many, right, everything financial services marketing like you never even have to touch the plant but you can still participate in this industry um where do you think and 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 part of this is about higher education right higher education starting to embrace this industry and develop career pathways if you were a college president or a faculty dean trying to think about workforce development where would you create pathways? Where do you think the most growth and opportunity is? Sure. No, that's an interesting question. I mean, look, at the, at the end of the day, something like cannabis cuts horizontally across um, so many different industries. It cuts across so many different academic uh, disciplines and departments, Yeah. right? So you can have, I mean, right now, I think where the, the greatest opportunity today is people that are dropping in, learning to be cultivators, right? Where there's, I think, you know, vocational opportunities that I want to be a grower. I want to be a trimmer. I want to be a bud tender working in retail. I want to be someone that's involved in transportation, right? There's a lot of functional areas where there's a lot of job opportunities right now. But I think as the industry evolves, as we've been talking about, and we start to um, we start to hatch all these different segments. Um, and, and just by way of example, you know, today a lot of the products that you see in the market are the types of products you find in a convenience store or a supermarket, right? Things mm-hmm. that are edibles, for example, beverages, um, consumables, things that you can smoke, right? But a whole kind of emerging area of the industry are in things like in building supplies, for example. And, and one other way of thinking about that is, you know, in the cannabis plant, you have the flower and the leaves. And that's what's commonly being used to consume, to do extractions, to infuse mm-hmm. into foods and topicals and whatnot. But what you also have is the stock. And you have the seeds and the roots that you can now put into things like help, uh, hemp milk or, uh, or um, you know, oil, cooking oils. Or Are you the person who told me about they're getting rid of vinyl records and building them out of hemp? I, I wasn't, but that's yet another example. Okay. And so what you, what, you, what you don't see yet is, for example, the Home Depot of cannabis. And what people don't realize is you can make insulation material. You can make you know, particle board. You can make bricks, like what's called hempcrete. You can make um, a compost. There's, you can literally go into a Home Depot of tomorrow and find products that were made with the stock, the roots, and the seeds of cannabis that you don't, they exist today, but they're not as widely commercial of, commercially available as they will be in a future that will be coming soon. I would be interested in seeing the Home Depot of cannabis yes. and like a whole product line based on on that. I mean, I think yes. someone needs to do that. Um, right. So coming back to the question, yeah. if I will, from an academic perspective, right? Today, it wouldn't make sense for someone like you're saying, like the dean or president of a school to say, well, the architectural department should focus on building materials made out of cannabis. I mean, it would make sense from my perspective, but that's very early stage, yeah. right? Where maybe in other departments, like in agriculture, it makes a lot more sense because hemp and cannabis production is is so you know widely practiced currently. Um, but really when you get into construction and architecture and then furthermore, things like medical science and, and pharmaceuticals and just 
all the different facets of it, then you start to see how it cu cuts across so many departments. And one other one is in anthropology and sociology that cannabis also has spiritual dimensions and cultural dimensions and customs where people have lifestyles that they live around cannabis and honoring the plan. So yeah. it has that breadth to it. And yeah. when you think about it, what other plant has all those different dimensions and breadth that you can literally probably walk into any department of any university and ultimately find some area of subject matter that you can infuse cannabis into the curriculum? You can extract and infuse cannabis <laughs> into the great. What's interesting, though, this is not how universities are approaching it, right? right. I imagine it is very siloed. It is, uh, you know, yep. the because I, I know, because I know, right, Santa Rosa Junior College, yep. they have an incredible Schoen Farm and they have an incredible hemp, uh, you know, building out cannabis programming. But there's a lot of resistance, Right. Mm -hmm. And and there's a lot of resistance because of the stigma of the plant. But over time, the stigma is going to get worn down. And you saying right. when we can actually embrace this plant, there are things beyond the psychotropic, uh, you know, uh, yes. impacts that are going to really benefit society. And we should embrace it. Like what, what will happen once we actually fully embrace this plant? And, de and deal with the restitution of the trauma that the war on drugs has caused. Yeah, well, I mean, I think what, what we have is, I mean, truly for those of us that, that, that are in it, I mean, we, we see that there's almost like a renaissance that is going to be happening soon in the industry. And, you know, we call it an industry, but, but it is, we also call it a movement. You know, and yeah. we are coming out of the dark ages of cannabis where the science and the knowledge around it has been suppressed, primarily here in America. And as that um, stranglehold on the knowledge of cannabis is lifted and we're able to study it academically, we're able to practice it commercially, we're able to go through all these applications, then we're going to see an explosion of knowledge and application like we saw in the Renaissance. And mm -hmm. in this case, that Renaissance is going to be cultural. It's going to be industrial. It's going to be commercial. And, and yes, that stigma is quickly going away as that emerges. But interestingly, what you see probably most commonly in academics is you see cannabis being uh, taught in law, for example. Why? Because it's the regulation yeah. that is leading it legally, right? It's totally legal to be a, a cannabis regulator or a cannabis lawyer to be paving the legal pathways and the regulatory pathways that will then the commercial, the, the, that's laying down the rails that then the commercial train will, will ride on. So it's in law and you're also seeing in business schools where it's teaching in entrepreneurship and business management, the new breed of business leaders that will be ushering in these new cannabis companies. So really in business and law, but then you're going to see all these other dimensions and areas where you can practice it. I love that analogy, laying down the tracks that the commercial enterprises are going to follow. That's right. Are you a professor <laughs> or do you have an interest in being a teacher? Because I am, I, <clears throat> I, you don't seem like you're just a practitioner. You're just a business owner. You seem to really be interested in people understanding the full breadth. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I've, I've, I've had my, um, my stints in, in academia, I was an MBA professor at uh, Dominican U University of California for a couple of years. Um, I've taught in numerous incubators, both cannabis incubators and non-cannabis incubators, and I've, I've taken an educational role in those mm -hmm. institutions. And it's, it's something that I've loved my whole life. I mean, I've, at one point in my life coming out of college, I wanted to get into academia and get into my PhD, and I felt it was in, in part a calling of mine. Uh, but I ended up going down the business pathway instead. Yeah. Um, and and so now in my life, what I do is by by day mostly I'm doing cannabis as an entrepreneurial endeavor, and by night, so to speak, um, I continue to teach um, and mentor uh, entrepreneurs. And yes, there's a very much like an academic uh, um, um, uh, instructional side of that. Absolutely. Yeah. Because it's gratifying, right? I mean, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a teacher. I'm an educator. It's gratifying to help others, teach others kind of yeah. what, what, what you've learned and you've amassed a lot of knowledge, right? And you've, it's hard fought, hard won. Where do you see the industry going next? It's 2022, <clears throat> right? Yeah. It looked like before Biden came in, it looked right. Like I think yeah. that they just passed the house passed some legalized. Mm -hmm. 
that ain't happening. That's right. right? That, Biden can't get he can't he can't get a stimulus passed. How is he going to you know legalize cannabis? Yeah. What is the what is the, what is the future? Sure. Well, you can answer that by looking through that through various lenses, right? One is regulatory, right? So we know that for certain more states are going to come online, right? You're going to see illicit states go to medical. You're going to see a medical states go to recreational. We're, we're, we're seeing that happening at, at an accelerated rate. I think for the next three to five years, that will happen. So states that today are, are not, uh, are illicit or are medical, you're going to see them soon become recreational. And that's happening in real time. Um, there's going to then be that turning point where it becomes federally legal. And I think that's probably more in the five year or you know plus uh, point mm-hmm. in history. Um, but then once it's federally legal, then there's additional layers to that, right? Then there's internet, uh, uh, interstate commerce and how different states are going to be able to do import export between the yeah. states. There's going to be states that are going to allow, be allowed the sovereignty to say, I don't want cannabis. So just cause something's federally legal yeah. doesn't mean that you can buy it in all corners of America, just like in California, it's legal, but it's only being practiced commercially in one third of the jurisdictions. Yeah. Wow. What a crazy patchwork. This is going to be where you have right one third of California, one third of Washington State, you know, two thirds of New York. I mean, it's just going to be a crazy patchwork. Yeah. But it is going Mm -hmm. to mature. The industry is going to mature. More capital is going to flow in. More uh, corporate businesses are going to flow in. And ultimately, with maturity, do you I mean, like what are some of the things that how, how, how are you and others who survive going to benefit from this maturity? Well, I mean, certainly for some of the early adopters or early innovators like myself, uh, for those of us that can kind of stick it out, um, I think we're going to have that first mover advantage. And I think we're going to be the more elder statesmen at that point that, that bring a lot of that experience and that knowledge and that history with us. And that, like any industry, I think has a lot of value. Um, but again, I mean, I think that the cannabis movement as a whole is going to be so far reaching that, um, people like myself are just going to get in some ways lost in, in the movement. Right. Uh, just, you know, you mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, I started in the organic products industry yeah. and it was the same thing. You know, when we were there, we were a very tight knit community. It was a very niche nascent industry. Um, we all knew each other. And as that, as organics became ma- mainstream, well, number one, it moved away from foods and things we consume to then you can get our unorganic mattress or organic cat food or, mm-hmm. and building materials and sustainability and architecture and lead certified. And, yeah. and it, it, it entered into pharmaceuticals. And so now it has that pervasive um, effect that we're going to see in cannabis. And so a lot of the people that I was involved with the organic movement, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, you don't, now we're just, we're just awash in what seems to be everyday life, right? You find organics, the sustainability movement. And that's what you wanted. And that's what you wanted. You you don't want, you don't want it to stay niche. You don't want it to stay semi-legal. You want this to be pervasive. You want to be part of everyday life. And, and once it becomes part of the fabric of society, of everyday life, our rituals, our customs, every aspect that we've discussed from, from construction and building to medicine to recreational use cases, th- then it's just part and parcel of our life. And where do I fit in? Well, I fit in where everybody else would fit it in life, right? I just play my role, right? And I don't have any special role because a lot of the uniqueness and the special standout roles come in a little bit more early stage than they do once they're just mainstream. I'm sure... When that comes along, you're going to find the next thing that you <laughs> want to do to be kind of entrepreneurial and ahead of the curve. Yeah. Um, but that is really exciting, Claudio. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Very excited about Guild Enterprise, Guild Extracts. And thank you for just sharing all of your wisdom with us today. Well, thank you so much for having me.